Children, brothers and sisters, welcome to this week's Sabbath service. I'm going to start off by reading a scripture, and this is from Acts 1.8. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. As far as prayer requests this week, we've had a lot of people, a lot of people I've talked to this week, are facing loneliness, to be quite frank. They don't feel comfortable reaching out and coming to fellowship meetings, and I understand that. But at the same time, they also want people that they can talk to, besides just me, and fellowship with. One person in particular is struggling because they are looking for a companion, and they're not able to find one. Um, another person is struggling because they're, they can't find friends locally to hang out with and go and do things with, which may seem like a very simple thing. People can talk to each other online, but the reality is people need people. They need physical contact with people. They need to be able to see them, not just on a camera screen, but in real life, which is one of the, way, which is one of the reasons why I believe that the Lord is encouraging me to encourage you to start local congregations. So as you're praying, please pray to see if you are one of the people that is called to start a local congregation. Pray to see if you're one of the people that's been called to reach out and, and talk to people. There are about 500 people or families on our mailing list. So we know that the people are there. And I've talked to at least that many people over the past, if not more, over the past several years. So we know that the interest is there. We're at a, a cusp, if you will, where we have this momentum in these people that just isn't whatever it takes to push it over the cliff and get this thing going. And again, this isn't about me, so it, it's not what I want. It's really what you want, what the Lord wants for us. So if nobody feels called, then obviously the time isn't right, and that's okay. I've said before that I'm jotting everything down and setting things up in such a way so that when I'm gone, this stuff will be there for whoever the Lord calls after me. But in the meantime, as we're saying our opening prayers and as we're praying throughout the week, let's pray for all these lonely people that, that need other people. Let's pray for the seekers. That the Holy Spirit will move them to whatever it is the Lord has for them. And let's pray for one another, that we can be one in Christ, not merely through watching me in a video, but through interacting with one another in some way. If you'd like to pause now to say an opening prayer and sing a hymn, please do so. Now for the unity portion of our service. I'm going to read the Shema in Hebrew and then in English. And I'm going to pause so that you can read it back. So that we as one can say this prayer together. Shema Yisrael, Yeva Elohenu, Yeva Echad. Hear, O Israel, Yeva is our Elohim. Yeva is unity. When praying on what to talk about this morning, I had several things throughout the week that I really wanted to talk about. But when I woke up this morning, the Lord told me, no, none of these are right. Go and, and search the scriptures, and I'll let you know when you found the right thing. I'll let you know when I found the topic that I want you to talk about. So I felt impressed to go to the Bible, and I did. And when I found Acts 1-8, I don't really understand why I'm supposed to talk about this, but I felt very impressed by the Holy Spirit that it's what my topic needs to be today. And as I read it, ye shall receive power. 
when after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So we're going to receive power from God. I'm just going to jump right into this. Those of you that are watching this video, I want to ask you, have you received that power? Do you feel the Holy Spirit of God in your life? Well, one of the ways that you know if you receive that power is because you stand as a witness to God. Now, here it says it will be in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. And I would say that this came true because... The published Bible is everywhere. The uttermost parts of the earth, there's missionaries all over the world sneaking into places where they're not allowed to. Some of them have snuck into places that have gotten them killed. To bring these words, the testimony of these apostles, to the uttermost parts of the earth. What about you in your life? I always think about Third Nephi when Jesus tells the people that the Holy Ghost fell upon the Lamanites and they knew it not. When I talk to people who have doubts, they don't feel like they're good enough. And I know there's some people right now listening to me say this, thinking I'm talking to them personally. The fact that there's more than one of you shows that I'm not. But if the Holy Spirit tells you that I am, then maybe I am. The fact that you have doubts is reminiscent of me that the idea that the Holy Spirit has fallen upon you and you know it not. I can tell you that in my life, when the Holy Spirit fell upon me and told me about this ministry, my wife knew what it was. I kept her mouth shut. She didn't tell me because she didn't want to push me to something. And also because we were very happy going to the church that we were going to. There were things we didn't like about it, but we were content. And so there was no reason to, to talk about it. No reason to push me. But slowly over time, I awoke to the reality of my calling. And I believe that's true of all people. And whether it's a calling in a particular church or sect or if it's a calling that is a personal ministry. When God calls the humble people, the people who don't feel like they're good enough, he has to call them early because he knows it's going to take a while before they get to a point where they feel ready to embrace their call. When he calls the people with egos, they go out and tend to make it about themselves. And it takes time for both to get where God actually wants them. We all have to grow in grace. I know that in some churches there's this idea that the leaders are perfect, that they're like many Jesuses, if you will. Oh, sure, they can make mistakes, and not everything they say is doctrine, but when they speak... The smallest little thing that they say becomes law. I, I remember, again, this is from my Brighamite background. I remember President Hinckley, and I loved President Hinckley. He made a, an off comment one time that he didn't understand why a, a woman would have more than one earring. And all of a sudden, people everywhere went crazy. I, I remember this lady, I worked at a, uh, a bookstore at the time. It's called the Benedict Books, so obviously LDS Bookstore. This lady came in. She's like, my daughter is so good. She's a ready student. She's president of a seminary class. She's, she you know, helps other people and volunteers. But I just don't know what I'm going to do with her. She's just gone through this rebellious phase. She won't follow the prophet. She has two earrings in one of her ears. I, I'm at my wit's end. I don't know what to do. And I was like, you're kidding me, right? When I was in high school... I heard parents complaining about girls sneaking out in the middle of the night to go be with their boyfriend. And you're worried about a second earring? Really? And that was at an off comment. Now, later on, he did clarify for those that said it was just an off comment, that his off comment was something that he wanted Latter-day Saints to do. 
But still, it wasn't, it may have been inspired, but it wasn't a revelation. It wasn't a prophecy. He's not a perfect man. And the idea that a woman would condemn her daughter who is fulfilling all righteousness, except for having one earring, where's the grace of Christ in that? So we have to get to a point where we, the people, understand that our leaders are imperfect, that the ones that demand blind obedience, they're over here being too egotistical. And the ones that have a message, but they don't want to push you to do anything, or they don't even want to give you the message at all, they're the ones over here that are too insecure. And I can tell you from experience, finding that middle ground is difficult. When do you get to a point to where you're too pushy? When do you get to a point to where you're not encouraging enough? I'll admit that I don't know where that line is. And so because of that, I'm going to rely today on the scripture that the Lord gave me to share with you. When you receive the Holy Ghost, you will become a witness. And that witness is going to come in stages. I believe, I've told you before, I believe everyone is called to a ministry. What that means is individual. But just living your life while building your relationship with God, that is your ministry. You don't have to stand on a street corner with a big sign and a Bible or a pointing finger Go to work, go to the store, go to the amusement park, and be kind, be a good person, let God's love and let God's light shine through you, well, listen for the promptings of the Holy Spirit, and even if they don't make sense, follow them. I have talked to people who are hurting. And I've talked to people who are rejoicing. I've talked to people who are angry. And all of these emotions and more can still shine the light of Christ through these brothers and sisters. Even when they know it not. Because there is a power there, even if we don't recognize it. There is a witness there, even if it's not the witness we assume God wants. I've had three people ask me this month, in some form or another, how to know about your ministry, about what it is you're supposed to do, what is it God wants. Well, that's the whole point of the Priesthood 101 class. That is made available, and, and I'm here to help you through it, or you can do it on your own. It's on the website and the ministry resources. It's a nine- or ten-week course, depending on how you want to do it. Will you consider the introduction week one or not? I generally recommend you do the introduction week one together. But when you're through that, if you've taken notes, you've kept your journal like it, like it recommends, you should be able to look back and know what it is that God wants you to do. doesn't mean you're going to know how God wants you to do it. I guess that'll be one or two. I don't know. But it's not a class that ends at week nine. The meditations that you learn in there, that relationship that you build with God, you can't just stop. I've said it before. When you get married, you don't you know, courting, dating, getting serious, getting engaged, married, done. We're not moving to separate houses. We're never talking again. You, you can't do that. Once you're married, there's a line there that, that's, you know, well, now we're exclusive. Now we are one in Christ together. But now you've got to grow as one. You've got to keep continuing on that journey in grace. It's the same thing when you're building a relationship with God. You can be introduced to Mormon Kabbalah. 
you can start the meditations. But once you have that aha moment, you don't walk away. You keep praying. You keep meditating. You keep studying. If you don't know what to study, start the manual over again. It's not going to hurt. You're going to get more out of it the second time because you know you're preparing yourself for what's coming next and you've already done it once and so you have more experience doing it. I was playing a video game last night. I haven't played video games in a long time and I just... One in particular that I really love, I, I missed it and I wanted to play it again. My kids are watching me play and they're like, wow, Dad, you're terrible at this. And I'm like, I used to be amazing at it. What happened? Well, I can tell you what happened. It isn't just button mashing. I've got to move with one stick and move a camera with another and pick different things to, to do what I need to do. And then while I'm holding one button down, move another button. It takes real coordination. Gone are the days when you have a four direction D-pad and an A and a B and that's it. And yeah, I used to be really, really good with the controller with all these buttons all over it. And now I'm not. Because I stopped participating. I didn't need to practice. It used to be that that controller was like a part of my hand. It was like it was a part of me. And now it's like this foreign thing that I have to get to know again. Now, I've, I've counseled with people in relationships with their spouses that have gotten to that point. It used to be that their relationship, they, they just knew what the other one was thinking. And now it's like they're living with a stranger. So it isn't just video games. It's also in our human interactions. But likewise, it can be this way with us and God. God never really goes away. We just stop talking and listening. And I do like the marriage example because I've seen it where people live in the same house but they don't know each other because they don't communicate. Christine thinks that I communicate too much. But I'm the kind of person where it's all or nothing. And she tolerates me because she'd rather have the all than the nothing. And I appreciate her generosity in this. God's the same way. He appreciates your participation in your relationship building. He has things he wants you to do. He has things he needs you to do. And that can be something as simple as buying groceries for someone. Inviting somebody over for dinner. Knocking on a door or giving someone a call. It can also be more complicated. But please don't feel guilty if you're not ready yet. For what you know the Lord needs you to do. And I know some of you I'm talking to know what the Lord wants you to do. But you're scared. And so you don't want to admit what God wants you to do. And Satan is going to try to use that against you. So I wanted to tell you that you're okay. God accepts you where you are. The grace of Jesus Christ. The atonement of Jesus Christ. They pick us up. They make us safe. All things in God's time. There's a book by an author I used to really enjoy reading. And he wrote a lot of stuff on, on theology. But he wrote a, a book that I found very interesting about um, near-death experiences and experiences of, of people who had family members die and they were able to see what happened with their spirits after death. Very, very interesting book. One of the stories that really stuck with me, though, was a person, I believe it was a man, who was in a hospital, and he was dying. 
And I don't remember if he actually died and saw this and then came back or if this was a vision that he had. But what he saw was an, a woman who was older, who was, was dead, and she was just frantically pacing. And she was talking about genealogy and she was talking about LDS temple work. And yes, this did happen in Utah. And this woman just kept saying, we've got to get them all sealed from Adam until the last person, from Adam until the last man, as actually said, I've got, we've got to seal them all. We've got to seal them all. And uh, when I read this, it was around the time Pokemon came out. So it, was, it reminded me, oh, we've got to catch them all. We've got to catch them all. But I remember not feeling right about this. Yes, at the time, I was a very strong Brighamite. I believe fully that that had to happen. And so I didn't think she was wrong. But what felt wrong was the panic in her voice. It has to happen now. No. If you are with God, then there is no panic. You know that you have the peace of Christ. You know that all things are going to happen in God's time and it's going to be okay. The millennium says it's going to be a thousand years. I don't believe that's going to be a literal, okay, it's going to be from this date to this date. And maybe it is. Maybe I'm wrong. But either way, the first resurrection is going to happen. And there's going to be people here upon the earth, from what I understand. If that's true, and temples are going to dot the earth, whether you believe in the bringing my teachings or not, you can't tell me that God hasn't set things up in such a way to make sure we have enough time to get all the work done. The reality is that, from a bringing my perspective, if we were to do all of the genealogy humanly possible, and all of the temple work humanly possible, before the millennium, we're still not even going to be halfway done. If everyone is supposed to be baptized, and ordained, and sealed, and set apart, and everything else that they do in their temples, from Adam and Eve all the way until the last people, and there's 9 billion people on the earth now, and I've read some scholars say that over, uh, either le I think half of the human race is alive right now, something like that. So we'll say there's another 9 billion people. We'll say that wrong. We'll say 10 billion. It's 19 billion people that need to be baptized, sealed, and everything else. There's two problems with that. Number one is, that's a lot of people. We're going to take, we're going to have to have a thousand years in the millennium where the full-time job of people is just to go in night and day and get this done if this really has to happen. Number one. And number two, even if we got every single name that is available, I doubt that that's half the names. So we'd still have another, what, 9 billion people left. And probably a lot more, honestly. So why would this, this ghost, this angel, this demon, whatever it was, be frantically panicking? Is God going to set us up to fail? No, of course not. Whenever I get in a panicky moment, I always think about that. I think, oh man, I'm not doing enough. Oh, this, oh, that. I remember the story and I know that it's okay. Everything's going to happen in God's time. I don't know when it's going to be. So if it's tomorrow, I'm ready. If it's 100 years after I'm dead, hopefully I've set everything up. And whatever I haven't, I know the Lord, the grace of Jesus Christ, will make up the difference. Everything isn't on you. Everything isn't on me. The power of the Holy Ghost will come upon you and give you power. Give us power. That doesn't mean... That the way of the world is on any of our shoulders. But it does mean that we have the power to do the work the Lord called us to do. And we have been asked to do it imperfectively. Imperfectly.
I think I might have just made up a new word there. The whole idea is that we serve each other in our imperfections. When we make, excuse me, when we mess up, there are ways that are horrendously awful, and those ways to mess up are egotistical, selfish, and we're taking for ourselves. But when we're striving to do our best, our best is always good enough for God. It doesn't matter if it's good enough for somebody else. Last story here. I talk to people online a lot. And a lot of them want to get me into a trap. They ask me questions, and then they try to circle around. They try to get me to say something. And then they finally get to the point where they're like, Aha! I gotcha! And then they generally get really upset because I don't care, number one. And number two, did you? What really is your aim here? What is your goal? If your goal is to humiliate someone that's trying to tell people to love each other, congratulations. You win. I guess now we can all hate each other in peace. So, what does it matter? If somebody makes me look stupid online, at the end of the day, are you really fighting against me personally? A stranger that you don't know? And are other people going to say, oh, God can't be real now because this person said this thing. The reality is that those people, they already have their opinion. And nothing you or I are going to say is going to change their mind. The only thing that can change their mind is getting on their knees and looking for God themselves, building their own relationship, seeking for this power of the Holy Spirit, mentioned here in Acts 1.8, to fall upon them. The thing, the gotcha moment for me that they usually get me on is the fact that I refuse to try to convert them to Mormon Kabbalah. I refuse to try to convert them to Mormonism. I refuse to try to convert them to the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. I merely invite them to create a personal relationship with God. And yeah, that's weird. That's not what Christians do. Yes, typically people want to convert people to Jesus. But typically they want to convert people to their Jesus, to their church. And that, honestly, for me, is one of the greatest parts about the Fellowship of Christ. You want to come here? You're welcome. You want to go somewhere else? You're probably going to do better there. Honestly, I would much rather encourage people to go to another church because we don't have activities here. We don't have programs for children. We have videos that I make and articles that I make so you can do your stuff at home. But what we have isn't enough. There's nothing for me or anybody else to convert people to when it comes to the Church of Jesus Christ and Christian Fellowship. So everyone's welcome, but it's not good enough. It's not sufficient. It isn't going to meet people's needs. And so when I talk to people online, I, I don't have something to convert them to other than God. And even if I did, that's why I was a terrible missionary for the Brighamite Church, Salt Lake City Church. My role has never been 
and never will be to convert people to a particular church or sect. It's always been about strengthening and building your personal relationship with God and let God tell these people where he wants them. So my question for you today is, where does God want you? God calls all of us to build the kingdom. And that doesn't mean we do it from a pulpit. We all do it from wherever the Lord asks us to serve from. So, has the Holy Spirit fallen upon you? Has the Lord given you a task, something to do? I could go on and on about the mistakes I made when I first accepted my call to this role in the fellowship. I want you to know you will mess up. But I also want you to know that that's perfectly okay. Joseph Smith messed up. Moses messed up. John the Baptist messed up. You name any prophet, any apostle, they messed up. And these are the people that we study when we're studying the scriptures. So what I ask you is, if the Lord called you to do something, please accept your opportunity to mess up. Because the grace of Jesus Christ has you covered. Why am I encouraging you to do this? Because my role is to help you build your relationship with God. And when you're serving God and doing His works, you can't help but build a stronger relationship. So I feel impressed to read this scripture one more time before I close. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Translating this into your speak, you will be a witness in whatever town, city, village, or community you are in, in whatever state, provenance, county, etc. you are in, in whatever country you are in. And because of the internet, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Yes, you. Even you. Let's build that relationship, personally and together. That's my message, and I'll leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ. We're now going to move on to the Sacrament of Communion, but before we do, I have a request. Those who have been watching this video know that after my message, I play a recording of myself reading the statement on communion. I've always felt rather weird about that. It just seems kind of odd to speak and then play a recording of myself. I, I don't really like that. But at the same time, I haven't really felt impressed to ask anyone in particular to, to read the statement. I do feel impressed this week, however, to throw this out there and ask, is there someone out there that wouldn't mind recording themselves, reading the statement, then sending it to me? And then I can play that recording, and, or, or if it's multiple people, you know, every week we'd have a different person, or alternate between people. It's a very simple task you it won't be named unless you want to be but if you feel impressed by the spirit or you're willing to read that statement on communion for the fellowship i would greatly appreciate it it would end a little bit of awkwardness from my perspective and make me feel a little bit more at ease about all this with that i'm now going to play that recording christine is going to say the prayers offer the the prayers from the book of mormon the book of Avar. And then you'll have an opportunity to pause the video and partake of communion. And then we'll move forward from there.
At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to his mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshiping Jesus Christ through God's word, the sacrament, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee, in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of Thy Son, and witness unto Thee, O oh God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. I want to thank all those who have met with us today to worship together. I hope you felt the spirit, and I hope I was able to speak to you spirit to spirit. If you did get something out of this message, I would like to encourage you to please share it. Like it on YouTube and share it so that other people can find it. And hopefully we can bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. I will now offer our closing prayer. Elohim should I. We bow our heads before you at this time and thank you for this opportunity we've had to meet together as saints, to worship together as Christians, to fellowship one another with one another in private, for those of us that are doing it alone, in public, for those of us that have invited others into our homes to watch this message together. And we thank you that you bless us with this technology, this opportunity, so that those that don't have a place to worship, that there is something available for them. We ask that the spirit that we've felt in this meeting will continue with us through the week, that the service will recharge the batteries to those who are struggling and in need. We ask that you please put a special blessing on those saints that are seeking fellowship in their local area, their local areas. Help them to find the people that they need so that they can build personal relationships, not merely with you, but with one another. Please grace us with your spirit. Let the Holy Spirit fall upon us that we will know how to build the congregations you've asked us to do. You've called us to build a temple. Please help us to raise the funds. We've been given the revelation. We, we know we have an idea of what it is that you're seeking for us to do, what you're asking. Please help us to unite as one in Jesus Christ to accomplish the tasks that we have been given. They seem great. They seem overwhelming, but we know that all things are possible through you. Please show us the door. Show us the way. Open all avenues to us to help us to do your work. Help us to be the light upon the hill that you've asked us to be. 
Help us to build the non-denominational temple that we need, that all saints may come and worship. The groups that don't have a home and, and don't have anywhere to go will have a place that they can go and worship you in peace, fellowshipping one, one another. I feel your spirit asking us to build these temples all throughout the earth, but we're not there yet. But I know through conversations I've had, speaking spirit to spirit with others, that there are places where you need these. In various states here in the United States of America, in Canada, in Australia, all over Africa, in Europe. There are saints that are willing and there are saints that are ready. But we don't know how to accomplish this task. We see the end goal, but we don't really know where to start. And so we ask you humbly today, Father, please, Mother and Father, help us to know what to do, to know how to get there step by step. We have pieces of the puzzle. Please bless us with the pieces that we are missing or with clarity with the pieces that we don't understand. This is your work that you've called us to do. Please help us to do it in your way, not in ours, in your time and not in ours. Please soften the hearts of those with land they will know that a portion of their land has been set apart by you. Those with funds, a portion of their funds have been set apart for you, whether it be to buy lands or to buy materials, so that we can accomplish this work that you would have us do. So that we can, as the church, fellowship in Christ and be the people that you have called us to be. We thank you for all of your many blessings. And we pray these things to thee humbly. In the name of thy beloved Son, even Jesus Christ, so mote it be. Amen.